Good afternoon and welcome to FBI LIDA's webinar series. We are committed to advancing the science and art of law enforcement leadership. These webinars are designed to promote the exchange of information to improve law enforcement practices during a time of crisis when our physical classes have been placed on hold. All webinars will be recorded for future viewing and posted to the FBI LIDA website. Certificates of participation will be emailed within 24 hours to all Zoom registered attendees along with any related presentation materials. These webinars are not currently post certified. Visit fbilida.org for the most up to date webinar information. Each webinar is an average of one hour long and takes place on Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time throughout the month of May. Today, our Director of Curriculum, Dr. Neil Moore, will be joined by our own FBI LIDA instructor, Jerry Thompson, to discuss committing to continued education and growth within law enforcement. Without further ado, Dr. Neil Moore. Thank you, Laura. It's great to have you back again to the FBI LIDA family. Welcome again. Thanks for all the support uh, during the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, some good news, some really good news. I was talking with our chief operating officer yesterday. Uh, it sounds like the pace for FBI leader classes is about to pick up. We're hearing uh, and starting to schedule at least into mid-June, and it looks like heavily into July. So for those classes that were postponed, we're getting ready to get her back in gear. And so uh, we're really looking forward to that and getting our, our teams of excellent instructors out, in, out into the field to be with you. For those who've never taken an FBI LIDA class, uh, go to our website, you know, fbileda.org, and uh, we'd love to have you in class and, and get you exposed to some of our really, really great instructors. Our, uh, our guest today is a guy who is one of my favorites, and if you've ever taken a uh, Supervisory Leadership Institute class or a Command Leadership Institute class, uh, you may have you may have met this guy, and you want to you want to talk about a fun class and a fun way to learn. Uh, Jerry Thompson is, is your guy, and Jerry, I, I'm not blowing smoke up your skirt. What I'm telling you here is a lot of folks lo love you, and I think that is sincere. Jerry uh, spent 31 years in uh, law enforcement, having served with the Ohio State Highway Patrol. Uh, he started his career. You talk about a purpose-driven life. Started his career as a cadet dispatcher and ended his career as the Northeast Ohio LCS unit commander. So good, good long career. During his tenure with the Ohio State Highway Patrol, Jerry uh, spent a portion of his time teaching at my alma mater, Kent State, both on the main campus and on the Trumbull campus. So if we've got some listeners out there from Ohio, Northern Ohio, uh, Jerry, this is Jerry's stomping grounds. And so we're glad to have him here. Jerry holds a bachelor's, bachelor of science degree in human resource management a Master of Science in Organizational Leadership, working on a Master's in Education, and he is a graduate of the Northwestern University Staff and Command School. He is an entrepreneur, having taken several products successfully to market. He is the owner of Listen Recording Studio, uh, in, uh, and I think he operates out of his home for that. He's married to his beautiful wife, Beatrice. They have two grown daughters. Uh, Jerry, you've led a great life, buddy, and I know you're a busy, busy guy. Welcome to the show. And uh, I know our topic here is read to lead. Mm -hmm. and, and I think a lot of us, Jerry, that, that uh, have worked in the classroom, uh, our students will recognize the fact that most of us at some point will say, hey, leaders are readers. And, and, and that's just the reality of life. Where are you going to take us today, Jerry? Well, you know what? Uh, I'll come right off of what you just said. And thank you for the introduction. And I'm making sure you're talking about me. Um, I, gotta say, I have to say this to everybody listening. And uh, Dr. Moore, Neil, um, he is a master likewise at teaching. And there's never a time that I get the opportunity to sit in his class that I'm in awe or I'm taking something away. And I'm saying, how is he able to take all that knowledge that he has and to relay it simple? And I'm saying, making it simple that everybody can understand. Um, you had ended by saying that all leaders are readers, and that's one of the things that we do say. Not all readers are leaders, but all leaders honestly should be readers because um, that is where we pick up that extra knowledge that, you know, that is there. One of the things I'll say and where I'll take this, Neil, if it's okay, is that um, a lot of times when we say continual learning, and that's what it is, 
a lot of us will think that we're talking from an academic level, but it doesn't necessarily have to be academic. Yes, there's something to that if that's for you, okay? But it's not for everybody, but understanding that there are too many avenues or too many mediums out there now that we can go to get additional learning to increase our knowledge, our leadership knowledge. And that is like what we're doing here today um, through podcasts, um, you know, online classes. I've seen more online classes, uh, webinars, podcasts, all focused on learning. And all of us have a smartphone or a computer where we're able to go out there and grab that additional knowledge. You know, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, it's out there. Sure. Absolutely. Where are you going to start us at, Jerry? I mean, why in the heck should I read? You know what? Um, because hey, we could go to an old commercial and everybody who knows me is I'm going to smile and laugh, but um, because reading is fundamental, number one, you know, but not only is reading fundamental, I actually want to show you something here and I'm going to share my screen with everybody here for a second. And um, as we get this up here, right here, and if you can see that screen, you can see that um, when we're talking about that learning, if there's something that's different between knowing versus learning. And when we're growing up, and guys, um, if you ever had me in class, depending on what class you had, you would have heard me say this, we learned under what we call the organized model. And that is when you're sitting in school and you hear, you gather information, and reportedly you're supposed to know it. You're supposed to know it. And I think many of us can relate to if you've been in school or in college where you're not even paying attention <laughs> while some of the information is coming out, but you gather just enough information to pass whatever that test may be, um, what, whatever that rubric is that, we, that the teachers are using, you just gather just enough information to know. Um, and then once you have passed that instrument or whatever it may be, technically the knowledge is gone. I like to use the example of how many of us took algebra, maybe calculus, or one of those type subjects. And since you graduated, how many times have you used it? But it was it's so important at that time that you had to pass it and it was necessary information. I moved down to what you see where it says the acquisition model. And that I think is something that we do uh, very well, Neil, in the classroom because Learning is not just by gathering the information, but it's listening, learning, and more importantly, with FBI Lita, we're stressing, okay, you can hear all this, you can get all the nuggets and takeaways that you want to get, but now what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? So it's a combination of not one or the other. It's not either or, it's both and. Yes, I got to get the knowledge. Yes, I got to gather some information. But the true learning doesn't take place until what I have garnered, I actually put into practice. And just a quick model that I show, um, and that's the importance that we continue to do. It's not just in the knowing, it's in the knowing, grabbing those nuggets and takeaways, and then in the doing. And I'm gonna pull this off. I think I can do that right there. And there I am back, yep. Okay, Good. So. It also, it, it also can come, and I was going to say that, you know, obviously everybody is not readers in the sense of where they're going to take a physical book. And I'm grabbing a book showing, I'm reading this one right now called Stumbling on Happiness. In fact, actually, I have finished it, and it's by Dan Gilbert, um, okay. a great read. Done with that one. The next one I'm showing is The Noticer, and this is by Andy Andrews. I don't know how it's shown on the camera. But this is a good read. A lot of times, us as law enforcement officers and people, we think that it has to be just necessarily law enforcement. Right. But it doesn't. This book right here, Andy Andrews, for me, myself, and the type of books that I like to read, The Noticer Returns, of course, there was The Noticer. Um, great read about leadership and noticing the small things that your people are doing. Um, and acknowledging them. Go ahead. Nick. Okay. Okay. So Jerry, how does the noticer make you a better thinker? Whoo. 
it first of all makes me to realize that things aren't necessarily going to happen the way that I think they're going to happen. And I have to pay attention to those small things because those small things are the triggers oftentimes. And I guess that's, that's a good word. Those small things are the triggers that will give you the nuggets and takeaways. We always think it has to be something big and <laughs> I'm smiling because I'm, I'm looking at you and I see my hands moving. People know in the class, I'm always moving my hands uh, <laughs> or moving, yes, sir. moving around. Um, so I'm going to try to hold them down here. But, Be yourself, Jerry. Be yeah. yourself. <laughs> <laughs> we always look for those big things, and we think that it has to be something so profound and so deep, but it's not. The noticer is saying, pay attention to the small things. And so as you pay attention to the small things, really kind of like the big things kind of take care of themselves. Um, a very good read, a, a very good read that I would recommend for sure. Okay. Yep. You know, I, I teach a little bit in uh, one of the things that I, I enjoy teaching is some of the crucial conversation stuff. And I think part of it, uh, and, and again, picking up on uh, how, to, how, do, how does reading make you a better thinker. When you're reading that work, okay, one of the things that came to me was the fact that we are emotionally driven. Yeah. Uh, most people are emotionally driven. And one of the things that happens is if I'm getting ready to sit down with that, that person I, that I know I'm going to have a crucial conversation with is just trying to read who that person is. Okay. Are they quiet? Are they aggressive? Are they cynical? Uh, are they listening? I mean, and so, but I don't know that I would have originally picked that concept up that when I sit down on a crucial conversation, I need to be looking at the person I'm about to talk with and trying to read if their emotions are more in control at that moment, or if they're able to listen and their logic is more in, in line uh, with what we're about to discuss, because it would make a big difference in, on how they listen. So uh, again, I would concur. I, I, I think that one of the things that happens with uh, reading is the fact it makes you a better thinker and you start picking up some things, some other nuggets that other people have given us. So uh, good point, Jerry, it's a really good point. Well, you know, you, when you talk about crucial conversations, and here again, this book, The Noticer, uh, would be relevant to something like that, um, is noticing where that person is at. And I think that's also why it's important, um, and of course, we do this in SLI when we're doing the DISC and understanding people. Um, one of my favorite classes um, is, is the DISC and really understanding people understanding of course first yourself and then the people and then noticing and if they're that d that i s or c or the combination um, it helps me to approach that those individuals who i may be leading or you know who's under me and just how, the difference of of approaching them from the place that they're at so to speak is the difference between me getting through or me being blocked off because they don't want to listen to me so Sure. I'm staying with you for sure, for sure. Okay, all right, good, good stuff. Yeah. Gentlemen, uh, we actually have a comment that came in, not necessarily a question, but I'd like okay. to bring it to your attention because I think that it may be the case for many. Um, we had someone comment that continued education is never discussed at my agency. What recommendations do you have for someone, regardless of where they are in their ranking, and how to introduce education and learning as a commitment in their agency? Wow, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab on the back end of that, Neil, and you can grab on whichever end you want. Okay. Um, everybody's not going to necessarily see it. Okay. And there is actually something that I wrote down if I could find it in here. Um, a lot of times in leadership, we'll think that it's finality, meaning that, Hey, I'm now the supervisor, I'm the chief, I'm the who, whatever position that you are. And there's finality. And what I had wrote that uh, finality in leadership, it doesn't exist. So this is that learning that you're talking about. How do I get that continuing education? Um, first of all, recognizing that you, you'd never arrive, you never arrived, and that you always have to be moving, that your learning cannot become static. Unfortunately, depending on who the leadership is, and here again, we can look at it from a generational perspective. We can look at it that 
many leaders will think that they're successful because they have that quote unquote, that title. Um, so I don't need that. Well, one of the ways that it gets introduced, and this is in my humble opinion, is that if you recognize it, you begin to do it. And then not only that, you know, I will often tell people, please begin to prepare yourself to get in a position where you can make change. And once you're in that position, make change. You may be that catalyst. You may be that individual that is called to introduce that. And so get going, get in that position, be able to make change and then make that change if it's not happening any other way. Neil, I'll, I'll defer to yeah, you. I let me dovetail on that, Jerry. I mean, uh, I'm an old football guy, and I, and I like to listen to these football coaches. Dabo Sweeney down at, down at Clemson, he's got a saying, bloom where you're planted, okay? And really what he's trying to tell us there is you may not be able to control the upper echelons of your police department. Probably aren't, okay? But there's nothing wrong with if you believe in continual education and say you're a supervisor or even a patrol officer. Are you talking about what you're reading? Are you talking about and showing people that I'm, I'm pursuing my work, um, additional educational work, or I'm striving to get to other places where I can acquire knowledge? So, I mean, so part of it is model the behavior. Yeah. Um, an, an interesting thing that was done when I was running an institute, at, a police leadership institute in Texas, was uh, ad hoc book clubs within a police department. I had never thought of that. I'm an old baby boomer cop. Uh, my guys and gals would have thought that I'd lost my mind if I would have started to try a book club. Uh, but yet in that North Texas area, there were in police department book clubs where they would take a leadership text. Half a dozen of them would agree to read the thing and then meet at a coffee shop uh, on some Saturday afternoon and talk about the takeaways that they had. That's easily done right at the, you know, right at the line level. So I would say the first thing you can do if you, if you have a, a, a group that where you don't see that continuing education leadership from the top, bloom where you're planted. Let, let's start modeling that behavior that, that we want to see in our organization and people will pay attention to you. I think uh, that's one of the other messages that especially you all give an SLI. So good yeah. stuff. Well, you can add into that, you know, and remembering that again, it doesn't have to necessarily be in that book form. Um, but a podcast and just suggesting, hey, man, have you heard this? Why don't you listen to this? You know, I can kick out real quick Simon Sinek. Um, other, and there's many, I'm just saying Simon, and start with why, all those different things yeah. like that. But there's many others. And it may just be that one, maybe that, that two, okay? And one of the things that um, I like is that it doesn't necessarily have to come from up above. There's a saying that says, sheep draw sheep. And I'm not calling anybody a sheep. Hear what I'm saying. <laughs> Somebody said, he called me a sheep. I'm not calling anybody a sheep. Sheep draw sheep, okay? Sheep attract sheep. So if, if you're kind of like that lead sheep um, or that informal leader, um, you can begin to inspire, inspire others to begin to, you know, man, hey, I read this. What do you think about this? And I... Neil, you see, this is what I'm talking about, Neil, a book club, never even thought of it, but it's a great thing. And it's something that needs to happen within our ranks for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Great question. Good stuff. Good comment. Yeah. Um, Jerry, let me ask you this. Does, uh, what do you think about the connection between reading and becoming a better communicator? <laughs> um, there's definitely a connection. How I will explain that is, wow, I didn't know that one was coming, y'all. So y'all don't think that all of this is planned out there. So this is a great one. Um, I think reading does help you to better communicate. I Look, guys, I'm from Youngstown. I'm an inner city kid. And I can throw all the slang and all those different things at you when I, when I want to. Um, but by adding to my knowledge via reading, there's words that now I understand and that I can use proper. I got to say this, Neil, and you said this, and this prompts my memory. When I was a post commander down in uh, Lisbon, Ohio, and that's Columbiana County in Ohio, some of you might know where I'm talking about, um, I used to write formal 
correspondence that would go to our captain or to the district or to whoever, um, uppers, all right? It wasn't until I had a, an administrative assistant, her name was Lynette, and I would have her proof my uh, documents, okay? And being humble enough to understand, she would come back and say, hey, uh, Lou, this word that you used here, and she would ask me real kind, she would say, what does it mean? And I'd be like, well, it means this, 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 you know, in Youngstown, this is what it means. And she says, hey, Lou, why, why don't you check that word? And she was the one that began to prompt me to keep a dictionary nearby. And she would always say, if you're not sure, check it and watch. Y'all, hey, I'm a post commander. It would have been very easy to say, well, who do th who you think you are? No. So that, via that, that is what began me to begin to understand words. And we can say some words that we think we know what we're saying, but they're not. And it's very, very important that in communication, especially in written and also spoken communication, that you're, you're talking accurate, that the meaning that you're meaning to get across is coming across. And I think by reading books, by listening to other people talk, um, just here again, noticing those small things, it makes a difference in the communications that do take place, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I concur. I mean, uh, one of the, and Jerry knows me and, and a lot of folks know me. I mean, one of the streams that I like to read is the whole area of the emerging neuroscience. And uh, I couldn't, I couldn't spell amygdala before I read it in the book. So, so uh, and now I even know what it is. So, I mean, the, the blessing is that we get exposed to new words and, and we under, start to understand how to use them. And I think it helps them, uh, helps us uh, even in our, in our professional lives. Yeah, does. So um, that said, uh, anything else on your mind before I fire another question at you, Jerry? No, go for it. I'm, I'm good. Good. Okay. To... okay. Yeah. Um, let me, uh, let me ask another question. Um, talk about reading and reminders. I mean, are there things, I mean, if I've read a book, uh, what's the reminder part? Will, will reading help me re be reminded of things? Yes. And no, and I'm going to say this. I'm, when I talk about a book and even like this book, I can open up to pages in here where I have pages folded and um, I write at the top of things, uh, you know, there's notes that I'm going to write when I'm reading. Um, we talk about this at Lita and I, I'm going to say this, Dean Crisp was the one that turned me on to this and the very importance of journaling. Okay. And we talk about this in class all the time. And when I'm talking about journaling, I do it in the book because now that's my reminder. Not only do I do it in the book because I have a lot of books. I also have my journal where when I, wow, it, it jumps out at me and it's like, oh, I need to remember this or this is usable. Now I'm going to take it from the book and I'm going to put it in my active journal so that I can refer back to it. I'm not saying I'm old because I'm not, and I'm not losing it up here. God forbid that ever happens. But, um, you know, if I don't write it down, I won't remember. So I, I need to come back to it. And then here comes back to me talking about organized um, learning and versus acquisitional learning. Okay. So now I learned it. It's good. Now I need to use it or I need to do it or I need to give it to somebody else. And when I'm saying giving it to somebody else, I'm meaning in the sense of relaying it to them. And after you do that, it's going through that amygdala and everything else, you know, if I said that right, Neil, amygdala. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's going through everything else. And as it goes through, now I can recall, I, it'll come back when it's, I think when it's needed, go for it. I'm looking at it while you're talking. I'm looking at a, a question up here. Go ahead. Neil. You see okay. all those as well, Jerry. I was going to talk to you about um, spinning that question into an opportunity for you to mentor someone. And if the books that you've recommended have helped someone foster more as a leader. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, hold on. I'm almost there. Corporate. <laughs> It is, you said it, it's one of those things that um, you should be sharing what you're reading and what you think 
um, has af affected you positively um, with others. And again, I'll say some silly sayings, but it's just ways that I believe. I believe that the, the good Lord, he gets stuff to you to get it through you, okay? And if he's getting it in you, then if you're getting it back out, um, it's not only going to help you, it's going to help others to grow. Um, how crucial is it for an agency to make leadership development a, a strategic priority? Um, I don't know if you see that one, Neil. I think even more than ever right now with the times that we're going through with COVID-19 and the changes that have um, happened within law enforcement, it needs to be part of the strategy. And I'm talking about short-term, long-term. How are we going to improve our people's knowledge? How are we gonna make them better officers? Our officers are being required to do things that in my, I started back in the 70s, that I never thought in my life that we would be doing, okay? Yeah. Um, and our big focus is co community, you know, uh, community development and community, um, what's the word, Neil? Cause that's where you, you master community at. Policing? Yeah, right. commu yeah. Com community yeah. policing, you know? Yeah. Uh, it requires us to deal and talk to people in the community that they expect us to be at a certain level. Um, and so that comes back to the conversation we were having earlier of where can that come in useful? Mm -hmm. I understand when I'm talking to, um, when I'm talking to somebody on the streets and, and they're a street person, I can be there. But then also if I'm making a formal presentation or I'm trying to get buy-in from the community, I'm not going to be able to use that same type of language necessarily. I'm not going to, I need to use words that are relative to them. Go ahead now. So you're about to say something. Mm -hmm. Oh, what, no, I was, what I was going to do is kind of tie in here. I mean, I know you teach credibility is one of the blocks you teach. I've taught it. And I mean, when we look at Kuz's and Posner's work, I mean, clearly one of the, one of the cornerstones of credibility is the fact that we're forward thinking. Uh, and so that forward thinking also happens to be an element of strategic thinking. And you talk about a time that it's needed right now. I mean, uh, what, how, is this, how is this pandemic going to move policing? How different is it gonna look six months from now, a year from now, five years from now because of what we've gone through? So strategic thinking absolutely should be a part of, of what all police departments are doing right now and to get there to really get there, you have to engage in the acquisition of more knowledge and you have to start applying the knowledge that you're gaining so that, so that we have a better understanding of how we're gonna deal with pandemics and the aftermath in the future. And that, I think there's a huge tie between uh, reading strategic thinking and us being able to continue to be viable um, as a, the most visible arm of government uh, into the future. So I think it's a good point. Likewise. Hey, Andrew, I see your question up there. And uh, Andrew's question, if everybody can't see it, it ends with, how do you believe a great leader should be defined in the law enforcement world? And man, that topic could be uh, very, very wide. Um, but I, for me, and uh, Neil, please bounce off of me when I say this. Okay. You know, how do you believe a great leader should be defined in the law enforcement world? I think it should, they're defined by someone that you're willing to follow. If you're willing to follow that person and that looks different in different situations, um, it, but if you're willing to follow them, they're probably, they have something that you need or something that you see in them that's making them a great leader for you to be able to follow them. That takes me, and we'll talk about it later when I talk about actually the book that I wrote, Mascot Leadership. That's what it's about. It's people or you or leaders understanding that you're being watched. Mm -hmm. Everything you say, everything you do is being watched. And um, part of being that great leader is being a person of your word. And I can go down the whole trust because trust is very in, important with me. Um, you have to be trustworthy, you know? I can kick them off my head because it has become um, innate and one of those things that I have to live by. 
I have to tell the truth. A great leader tells the truth. And I'm not talking about being ugly. I'm not talking about being hard, but I am talking about, hey, I, I need to tell you the truth so that you can improve. A lot, oftentimes we'll hold back and not tell people the truth because we don't want to hurt their feelings. Well, I'm not looking to hurt your feelings. I'm looking for you to grow. I'm looking for you to one day take my place, take my place in that leadership role. And as you take my place, I hope that you'll see, and I've told the truth and you'll do with others. And that also comes with mentoring. Go ahead, Neil, I'll be quiet for a second. Go no, no, you're good, man. I, when, when I was doing some doctoral work, uh, I, I went out looking, Jerry, for uh, a quick definition of a great leader. And I went, uh, I went to Lao Tzu, okay, the old Chinese philosopher. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the saying that I found was this, it said, to lead people, you must walk beside them, okay? For the great leaders, the people will not notice their existence. Mm -hmm. For the good leaders, the people will praise. For the bad leaders, the people will fear. For the worst leaders, the people will hate. But when the great leader's work is done, the people will say, we did it ourselves. And so it's this concept that uh, great leaders empower others, okay? And so if, I'm in, if you're empowering me, am I going to be a willing follower? Well, of course I am. And so it ties right back in to, to where you took us, Jerry. So, I mean, this is good stuff, so. Look, I got tears in my eyes, people. If you can't see me, <laughs> did you hear what Neil just said? That is the awe that I received from Neil. And look, you're gonna have to write that down or I'm gonna listen to, re-listen to the podcast because man, um, wow, Andrew, that was powerful, which, what you just said, Neil, and I mean that seriously, that, that relates, woo, woo. I couldn't say it that way. I couldn't say it that way. Buddy, I'm just taking your lead. Hey, Laura, <laughs> hey, Laura how about running a, a quick poll for us? Let's see, let's see what uh, the folks that have tuned in here with us are thinking about. Okay. Oh, this is a good one, Jerry. Let me see this. Oh. This. Okay. <laughs> I ask this. I The question that I always ask when I'm in class is, how many hate to reads do I have in the room? Right? <laughs> and invariably, I will get one to three percent that say, I would just rather get my butt beat than, than read a daggone book. Okay. So yeah. we'll see what we'll see what the numbers tell us here as, as Laura uh, gets our folks involved in this particular question. Yeah. Well, you know what, and we talk about that again with reading, and I hope everybody's hearing in the sense that it, there's too many other mediums out there, and here again, podcasts, and look, our world has come so full circle that I can listen to a whole book online, okay? So now I don't have to read. Here again, listen, learn, do. Listen, learn, do. So I can stick those podcasts in when I'm working out or when I'm driving, I'm going to stick those earphones in there and um, I can do it that way. Um, so there's okay. not an excuse. You know, I see. I see. Look at the numbers. We get 9% who are the hate to reads. Okay. I read casually 43%. I'm a bookworm. So about a third of the people are digging in. And I would do it if I have time. And so that's at 16%. So that goes to that whole issue of podcast webinars, audio books uh, for that. And then the same thing for our hate to reads, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I think so. You know, um, we can find the time to do the things that we want to do mostly. And I'm saying how easy, who isn't, I, here would be a poll. How many of you have a smartphone? How much time do you spend on that, that smartphone just scrolling through some of the useless stuff that's on there? Um, if you have that in your hand, very quickly you could put it in your ear with uh, many of the podcasts that are out there um, so I don't have to read no more. I'm a physical book reader because as I showed you, I'm gonna make notes. I, I wanna make notes, I'm old school. Um, I, I'm gonna make the journaling and those type of things like that. Many people now, of course, you know, they'll listen to it and likewise, we'll, we'll, we'll make those notes. So um, I, I'm allowed to say it. There's kind of no more an excuse. There's no more excuse. There isn't. Yeah. You know, it, driving back and forth from work, depending on how long your journey is, you know, back and forth to work or um, working out. If you're working out, man, that's a great time. 
I love listening to music. Actually, and Neil said it, I'm in my mastering room at my recording studio now. Um, and I'm, I love music. I love music. Um, and so I'm listening to music, but oftentimes I'm listening to something that's in, increasing my leadership. So, cool. yeah. Mm -hmm. Jerry, not only are you a reader, an avid reader, you've written a book, okay? And I know, I know you're getting ready to wrap that book up and get it off to the publishers, just real, real close. Yes. Uh, let's, let's take a minute or two here and talk about mascot leadership. What in the world is that? Uh, take us on the deep dive as much as you can here in 15 or 20 minutes, Jerry. All right. Keep me on track because once I start talking, you know I can okay. go. Okay. Hey, <laughs> go for it. Let's go for it. You know what, this book actually, uh, it, it was- What prompted you to write it, by the way? You know what, um, a class up in Connecticut, I was teaching a CLI class up in Connecticut, and I can't remember exactly where, but on their wall, they had this big picture of a fire brigade. And in this fire brigade, they were probably about 150 strong, but there was a Dalmatian that was sitting there with the brigade. I had that aha thought, or that crazy thought that says, man, why every time you see fire people and they have their mascot, it's usually a Dalmatian. Just ask that question real quick. Went and did some really quick research um, on the phone, okay? Again, smart device. Grab that phone and here end up finding out, Neil, that Dalmatians, they're compatible with horses. And back in the day when horses used to pull the fire apparatuses, they could actually, the dogs would run along with the horses and bark. Technically, they were somewhat used as the, a siren to let people know that the fire apparatus was coming. Wow. The second part is, is that the horses that they had that pulled the fire apparatuses, they were often subject to being stolen. So they would keep the Dalmatians back with the horses if somebody would come in that you know they're not familiar with, they're going to bark. So they were also used somewhat as an alarm for <laughs> burglars. This gets me thinking what one thing identifies with law enforcement that we can say is honestly a mascot. My first real quick inclination was to think of McGruff, okay? You know, McGruff. Yeah. But McGruff is more a crime dog and not necessarily, I'm going to say law enforcement uh, in a whole. Um, further, just delving and thinking, journaling and writing brought me to understand that the true mascot of law enforcement is its leadership. And thus, mascot leadership. I'll take it a little bit farther. A Guys, and somebody will say something, I'm sure, but I'm in Ohio, O-H-I-O, -O, baby. The Buckeyes, if you look at like a Brutus Buckeye, we see him on the outside, but who is on the inside of that costume? And thus the mascot again, you know? Nobody knows who Brutus is, so to speak, except for those people who may help that him or her don that outfit and themselves, but we see him as a representative of that organization, Ohio State, and he represents absolutely everything that organization or that entity stands for. Take your school, take your school, um, whatever state you're in, um, whoever, if, you know, take your entity, whatever it may be, Think about that mascot and actually what that mascot represents for that entity or agency. Now we come back to the supervisor. Now we come back to that the first level leader, um, depending on where you're at. You are the mascot. You represent the agency. You're not out there necessarily doing the initial work, but when you arrive on the scene, it's like everything stops. Everybody who's working, they're going to turn to you. And others who are looking, they're saying, whoa, I don't know who this person is. They might not understand rank. They may not understand it, but they understand when they can see, okay, everybody's talking to this person. So this person has to be somebody important. Thus, again, the mascot uh, analogy that I use. So that's where it started. Uh, long and okay. short. Yeah. All right. So we got you started. Okay. 
So what, what journey are you going to take us on when we start reading this book, Jerry? Well, I, I use a monomic, um, the mas mascot, and obviously grabbing those uh, initials, the M, the A, the S, the C, and the T, and um, make that monomic saying, you know, when you think about the M, what does it stand for? Now, here's one of the things that I've done. Uh, a lot of the classes that I've been in, I would have this um, discussion that we're having right now. When you think of a mascot, what do you think of? And, uh, I would get all type of answers, you know, of a mascot, this is what they are, so on and so forth. Um, but then I would turn it. When you think of a leader, what do you think of? So there were some things that stood out and I have all the pictures of the charts that I wrote and we're taking them and seeing what words kept coming up. So for the M, one of the words that kept coming up was memorable. You want to be a leader that mascot leader that's memorable. And in a sense, when I'm talking about memorable, we're talking about good memorable. It's like that question that Adam had asked earlier, what's a great leader? Think about the person that you would consider to be that great leader. What are you remembering about them? What was that positive thing um, or the way that they carried themselves, whatever it was that was memorable to you? But here's another thing. When I talk about memorable, memorable, of course, there's that negative side where some people are remembered because they were bad leaders. Right. I confess. I, I have to confess. When I first became a lieutenant, I, I wasn't a good leader. And it wasn't that I was being um, malicious or mean-spirited or anything in that line. I just didn't understand what I didn't know. Yeah. And people were trying to help me. And back at that time, I'm like, I was answering with Andrew again, where I'm saying, well, shoot, I'm the leader. Well, yeah, you could be the leader, but that doesn't mean you know everything. Okay, you might be the supervisor, but that honestly doesn't give you supervision. And that is why, again, um, that learning cannot become static. It, you have to recognize. Oftentimes, Neil, I, I tell a story in class where it wasn't until I got a visit <laughs> from our major of operations. He flew from Columbus up to where I was a post commander at that time. And when he came in, it wasn't, it wasn't a conversation. It was a monologue. He told me to sit down okay. and he let me know. He said this really clear. You have no clue what you're doing. Wow. And, yeah. And if you don't turn this place around, we're about to remove you out of leadership. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So that was that aha, <laughs> be had significant moment that says, oh my goodness, I've got to do something. I share that, not saying, you know, anything except for this is why we teach so that people don't have to have that helicopter land. I think I still get shakes every once in a while when I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, that is one, I mean, one of the great things about our instructors, in my opinion, is the fact that we've accumulated a certain amount of scar tissue. And one of our goals is to get our, our, the folks in the classroom there through and on that leadership journey without necessarily getting the same knife wounds that we got as we came up in leadership. So yes. I think it's a great lesson, Jerry, a great story. So, so let's continue more with your book. Well, that's why I say being memorable and, you know, there were people, once I began to understand leadership and it happened through continual learning, it happened. I was in a hard place. I was in that corner that says something has to change. It happened where I had to step back and say, let me look at myself. Let me start listening. Let me start noticing to what people are saying. Um, and of course it didn't happen overnight. It was a three to four year process. Um, that I often talk about where finally that turnaround came and I honestly could say that I started to become a leader. Um, I would like to think by the end of my career that um, no, not perfect, no, not perfect, but um, I was that someone that people would follow, okay? And here again, you don't like talking about yourself, but there are some out there that would have said, yeah, you know what, Thompson was a good leader and I learned a lot from him. 
The Did other thing. Yes. Sorry to interrupt you. We had a question. Did you have a mentor during this time where you were understanding where some of your pitfalls were and how you came to grow through it? You know what? Yes, I did. And that is so excellent because you haven't seen the book, but the other part of the M is mentor. I use two words for that first letter, memorable and mentor. My mentor's name was Bill Costas. Um, Bill he helped me, first he was a peer, and this was a gentleman, not necessarily academically trained, but he had that it, whatever that it was. And he actually ended up moving up through the ranks in the Ohio State Highway Patrol, became the uh, Lieutenant Colonel um, of the Ohio State Highway Patrol. He was someone that everybody trusted. He was a man of his word. And if he said he was gonna do it, he was gonna do. I have deep respect for him to this date. People will hear me say it when we talk about that mentor aspect. To date, if there was railroad tracks and he told me to lay on those tracks and that the train wouldn't hit me, to this day I would lay on the tracks because I'm going back to Adam's question, he was that great leader. And I knew that he had my best interest in heart. Um, he helped shape me and mold me I to, to this date can call him and, um, and, and do just to speak to him or if I see him and it's not like um, mentorship. But let me say this, a lot of times when we talk about having that mentor, we oftentimes think that it takes a whole lot of time. It doesn't. It's just checking on that person. It's no different than us growing our children. Okay, I'm going to teach you. I want you to get better. I'm asking you to do this or handle this responsibility because one day I can see you taking my place. One day I can see you taking my place. So mentoring um, is very important and all of us should have a mentor. In fact, in fact, in where I'm at in the other room, um, one of my best friends, me and him, we mentor each other. Um, we hold each other accountable. So it's not being weak, and I gotta say this also, having a mentor is not being weak. And us in law enforcement oftentimes will say, well, you know, <laughs> no, 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 no. You, if you don't know everything. And if, when we talk about it in this, this is out of the book, and I, this is not in the book, but when we talk about it in this, all of us have that blind spot. I want that mentor who's gonna be honest with me to say, hey, Jerry, you're not looking at this from the right perspective. You need to consider this. Have you ever thought this way? No, this is how it's being viewed. Um, so how important it is, how important it is. So that's the second part of the M is the mentor. Um, I'll keep moving, Neil, if that's okay. Yeah, let's go. I want to hear more. Yeah, I'm going to say, and somebody is asking anonymous books on how to lead um, with someone, and I'll just say who micromanages. This is not my book, but one of those books that I think is very important, if you've been in any class, you've heard me say this, Leadership and Self-Deception by the Arbinger Institute. Leadership and Self-Deception. Um, in fact, one of the instructors that Jen Harris, and I think I've seen her name out there, Jen was the one that turned me on the Leadership and Self-Deception. That book, for me, changed even how I look at leadership. And there's other books that are connected to it. So for that person who's asking reference to the micromanaging, leadership and self-deception, the other book is The Outward Mindset and The Anatomy of Peace by the Arbinger Institute. But the first book is Leadership and Self-Deception. Um, I think it would help in that area. So now I'm segueing again, Neil. See, I'm moving like I'm yeah, You're good, you're good. <laughs> Talk to me about the A in mascot, buddy. The A uh, stands for authentic, being authentic. And um, they are uh, that one being who you really are. Uh, one of the things sometimes that in my own self-talk is, is that mm, people aren't going to like me how I am. But see, I'm not Neil and I'm not Laura. I'm not any of the other instructors. I have to be authentic to Jerry and Jerry is... And I know it might not be a, a turn on to everybody and some of you, you're too silly and you're too loud and all those different things. I know, but that's me, I'm being authentic. And if you're being authentic in your leadership, people will understand it. 
Um, and so that's what that A is uh, representing is someone being authentic. And of course, within the book, that would actually be in chapter three. That's in chapter three where we start talking about authenticity and okay. what it means in leadership. Neil, I, I have to say this. These are actually, and I quote some of the students that have been in my classes over these last five years or so, where I'm asking and they'll say, man, well, this is what authenticity means to me. And I'm thinking like, ooh, that's good. And yeah. I'll ask them, hey, I'm going to use that. And I capture their name. And you'll actually see them uh, referenced back in the bibliography for some of the things that are actually said in the book. So um, being authentic, how important um, that really is. Yes. If I move to the S, and I will, uh, for the sake of time, S, it talks about serving. A mascot leader or a good leader is a serving leader. And I'm purposely not saying servant leadership. I'm familiar with servant leadership. I'm familiar with Greenleaf and some of the other guys who talk about servant leadership. But I'm talking about serving leadership. And that is that mascot leader understanding that he's responsible for the people. If we look at it from a triangle, and I'm actually using my hands again, usually in leadership, the leader's at the top and the people are at the bottom, okay? Yeah. In, in mascot leadership, you have to invert that pyramid, okay? That triangle is inverted upside yeah. down and it's recognizing that the leader is at the bottom and he's serving his people who are at the top um, I can go real deep in that, but if you get the concept, and some of you have heard me talk about this, you're saying, well, where do you get this from? Where this is where it's coming from is mascot leadership. You have to serve. Being a leader is not saying that I have arrived and I don't work. One of the things I like to say, to get to the position that you're in currently, once you get that title of chief, if it's a lieutenant, whatever, colonel, Everything that you did once you get that title, everything that you did before that was just an audition. You just auditioned. Now, now look, now I'm the chief. Now I'm the colonel. Okay. Every, all that work prior to that was audition. Now, okay, let me see what you're going to do. Um, so now you have to start working. Now you really honestly have to start serving. And so how important it is. And that's how um, the aspect that I bring it from. So I'm, here, I got to say this. I'm a sergeant. Okay. Everything that you did to get there was just the audition. Now it's time to work as a sergeant. That's I'm right. A, I'm a lieutenant. Everything you did was just an audition. Now it's time to work. So um, that's where I talk about serving. Okay. Um, I'm at competent, and that's the C. So again, for those who might just be coming on, I'm using a monomic of mascot, M A S C O T. Um, this, the C is standing for competent. And uh, when we talk about competent, and even when I ask people in the class about competent, uh, there's a lot of words that come up. And one would be informed, one would be experience, one is knowledge. Um, I, I like the word, all those words are part of being competent. But more important, I think, is the word wisdom. Uh -huh. Very good. Because when you're talking about being competent, you have to take the knowledge, okay? That could be, we're talking about books and reading and continuing your education. Um, you have to take that experience. And all those things have to come together and it has to turn into wisdom, into a working wisdom. Um, any of you who are leaders out there, and I have to just be me, and that's go to, uh, the Bible says it quite well. If all you're getting, get knowledge and understanding, but the one word that they use in there is wisdom. And wisdom helps you to be <laughs> that great leader. Again, I keep referring back to Andrew because that was a great question, Andrew. Yeah. Wisdom is that thing that helps you to become that great leader um, that is necessary. So, Neil, where are we at in time? I'm curious. We're still good, Jerry. I think let's let's Keep, keep going. I'm going to, I think you can get all the way through the, the monomic. Okay, very good. Well, within that competent monomic, I talk about the importance of um, the FTO process. And a lot of times in um, first-line leadership, 
many of us will be leaders and we don't have a reference from where we're leading from. And so I believe that all of our law enforcement agencies have some type of FTO policy. And those things that we look at for new people coming on, they come in like five areas and that's appearance, attitude, knowledge, performance, and contacts. We right. pay very close attention to those five areas when we're training our new people. And we do have rubrics and checkoffs that we do that these people have passed. Fast forward. Once that person finishes their FTO process, their period, usually nothing happens with them. The next time they're talked to is when they have messed up. And when they have messed up, now me as the supervisor of that leader, we come down hard on them. How stupid can you be? Who was your FTO? You know, you should know this. Well, no, it's not. Leadership, true leadership has to begin as soon as that FTO period ends, my humble opinion, because we know that they're going to make mistakes and we shouldn't wait until they make mistakes. I oftentimes would use the example um, that we have said within our ranks, and I, I'm guilty of saying, oh yeah, seen that coming. You knew it's just a matter of time before that was happening. And we're talking about people that we're supposed to be leading. Yeah. And we see them headed down a path. You know, I've seen that coming, matter of time. Well, I use the example, that would be like me letting my five-year-old grandson stand out in the street, play in the street, and me not say, hey, dude, get your butt out the street, okay? Right. Um, there's no difference to me. And here again, Neil, I'll say this, you might know, might not know. I'll use examples of my grandkids um, because it's, it's similar. And for any, if anybody who asks, Riley is doing great, because I always talk about my grandfather. <laughs> Riley. Um, but yeah, the FTO period, I think, is very important that we as leaders understand that leadership has to begin as soon as that period ends. Because when that period ends, now that's when they really need us to be paying attention to att attendance, excuse me, uh, appearance, attitude, knowledge, performance, and contacts. Those five areas are the critical areas. And that's where our people, those five areas are where our people oftentimes will get in trouble. Yeah. And if we see it coming, we should be able to divert them off the path. And that falls within that competent area. I honestly think that is, is very, very important. Finishing up, if I talk about the O, I'm talking about optimistic. Uh, being optimistic, and when I'm saying that, I, I'll just use the word um, hopeful, okay? Hey, man, I see everybody with a 10 on their head, you know? And yeah, maybe this officer messed up in this area. Who out there, if you're listening, could raise their hand and say you've never made a mistake? And I can't see in the virtual digital world, but, um, you know, I can't raise mine. I told you I was, I was a bad leader. Uh, not because I wanted to be, I just didn't know better. I didn't have training and uh, there wasn't an FBI lead at that time or anything in that line. But when I'm saying optimistic, I'm talking about honestly being hopeful, knowing that I can help this person get better. Our organization is going to get better. Look, if that person who's in leadership is not maybe the best, I can be hopeful that I can, again, I can rise to that level. And then once I get into that, that position, I can be that person that makes that change. Cool. Uh, how important it is. So optimistic. And then the last, the T, the T could be the foundation because that T in mascot is standing for trust. Uh, critical, critical. It's the foundation to leadership. It's also the foundation to relationship. Um, so the mascot leader encompasses those areas, um, and again, we break it, I broke it down into chapters within the book. Um, I think it's a fun read. It's written kind of like how Jerry Thompson talks. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, like a squirrel. Okay, there's a squirrel. Yeah, I could change and still fall in within, but it's, it's written how I talk, um, and it's not a, a an academic read, let me say that. And then Neil, there's pictures in it too. There's pictures. Oh, okay, for that's for me. That's for my type of reader. Okay. 
I need the pictures. Jerry, when, when is your book coming out? Because I know the people that are, that are still with us uh, are going to want to know when your book is coming out. When, when can we start looking for it? It, it should be here in September. Um, I'm more than 45 days out. Technically, it's 45 days out. But I know just anybody else who has written anything out there, uh, you know, you say 45 days. Um, I would like to sit here and say the beginning of July, but I know by September for sure it will be out and um, we'll make the information available and hope that you guys will share it uh, with everybody. Okay. All right. Laura, do we have any other questions here? I know we're nearing the end of our hour here. Do we have any other questions waiting? It doesn't look like we do at this particular time. So if I can, I'm going to share this screen with us. We'll get going and we'll wrap up some information about next week's session. Hey. hey. All right. Okay. Who do we have next week, Laura? All right, next week, if I can pull this up a little bit, um, it looks like next week we are going to have Mike Mason joining us. Now, Mike Mason is the Senior Vice President and Chief Security Officer with Verizon Corporate Security, and the topic will be leading your path fostering a career and planning for transition. He has a number of years experience both in the private and public sector and also working for Verizon. So we're very excited to have him. Just as a reminder, that will take place next Thursday at 2 p.m. That will be the last of our May webinar series. And for more information about the FBI LIDA webinars or to view the recording of today's webinar, please go to fbilida.org. Thank you so much, Jerry, for joining us today. Neil, as well, you both have done an amazing job, and we so appreciate your insights. Jerry, nice seeing you again, my friend. Well, likewise, and thank you for the opportunity. Okay, see you soon. All righty. And we'll see you soon uh, next, next week, next Thursday, with Michael Mason. Thank you.